Hey, buddy. You're on mute. mute. Yeah, it would help if I was unmuted. Good morning. Helps a bit. How are you, man? I am good. A little tired, but good. Tired meaning health tired or tired because you didn't sleep? Oh, no, I slept. Well, I've got to shift my sleep schedule. I'm doing a um, class with Ty Cohen early in the morning which is a mastermind for people with businesses and stuff like that. I just jumped in, but that's at five in the morning. And then I've got my physical therapy at six 30 and then, boy, yeah. So I've been running around already and I'm like, okay, ready for, for coffee. <laughs> well, I think it may mm -hmm. just be you and me. And there were two other people, one who had signed up for the last time I did this, and I had to cancel because I wasn't feeling well and another who just couldn't make it this time. So it's just going to be you and me. All right. Sounds make good. It, make it fun and personal. Absolutely. Give me one second. I got to bring up a Word document so that I can take notes. Or I'll be happy to send you access to this if you want or both. Whichever. Yeah. Whatever you need. No, take notes if you'd like. That's cool. I, I, and doing whatever this is your show i'm just doing whatever you think is best for me all right all right i can never get this cockamamie thing out of the way I wonder if there's a way to sh shut this to minimize this there we go i don't know how i'll bring them back up but we'll deal with that okay so you, of course, know who I am. Um, I go by the acronym Entrepreneur Pro. And today we're going to be talking about three ways to de-risk your business. I believe, there we go. Before I start, let me just show you this video. Sure. I show this because I think it's important to understand that that's how fast a business can fail if you're not paying attention and thinking about the issues that I call de-risking. Way back in my career, I was working for another company. I was the liaison between the operating company and a number of subsidiaries. I had an incredible boss and mentor whose name was Max. We owned an amusement park ride manufacturing company and they built this particular element and the other loop elements in coasters. They actually built Disneyland, all the major rides at Disneyland. And we acquired them after that. The this particular element called a corkscrew was built in the yard of the company. One loop, actually it was two loops, and I would go out there every three weeks and ride the coaster. Uh, it was just the greatest damn fun. They ultimately sold that coaster, took it down, and installed it at Knott's Berry Farm. I'm sure you're familiar with Knott's Berry Farm. Mm -hmm. When Knott's Berry Farm bought the ride, they paid $580,000 for it. And they installed it for another 300. So they had about a million in the ground, spent another million promoting it. And in the first full year, when they began opening this ride, when they opened this ride for the full, first, full, first full year after that, their attendance went from 3 million to 4.5 million people, all attributable to this ride by their own statement. And each of those people were paying $12. So they added $18 million in revenue, most of which was the, to the bottom line from this ride. And Arrow, the company that we owned, made 8% on $580,000. So 
So they made about 48,000 and Knott's Berry Farm made 18 million every year thereafter because of this ride. I went to my boss and told him I thought we needed to change the model so that we could start generating revenues based on royalties, put the rides in on a concession basis. My boss, Max, explained that it wasn't the right culture. We should have never bought these companies. He was brought in after we bought a number of companies. But he told me that I could put together deals to do that myself. So I started advertising the fact that I would buy rides, syndicate money from other investors, and put the rides in parks on a concession basis. And I got one deal. There was a park in Panama City, Florida that wanted the ride. And there was a company that was willing to sell them a ride. And they had already negotiated to buy the ride. And I stepped in the middle and we closed the deal. I went to my attorney to get a contract and found out that I couldn't do it. I'd already agreed to do it. I was already planning to do it. But he said, there's this thing called the Securities Exchange Commission. And any money that you raise from anybody needs to go through them. And it needs to have a special document. Long story short, I told him, I'm going to do the deal. So tell me how to minimize my risk. And he said, first of all, go to friends and family because they're less likely to sue you. And secondly, put a document together akin to what you would have to do in a very more complex way for the SEC. And be sure to emphasize risks. Think of every risk that could possibly happen and include that in the document where you explain what you're doing. I literally thought and thought for days and finally came up with nine risks, none of which I thought were going to happen because why would I be doing the deal if there were risks, right? So wrote up, wrote down the nine risks, went ahead and and with the deal. And as it happens, seven of those no way in hell are they going to happen risks happen. Seven of the nine risks actually materialized. They didn't ship the right on time. So it didn't get here on time, which didn't matter because the park didn't open in time, ended up having to move it right away to Tulsa, where it didn't operate because the ambient temperature was too high and out of spec for the ride. The first year was a total disaster. I reacted to everything and ended up putting the ride in Denver, where it was one of the best investments I've ever made. The first year almost killed me. I had just quit my job and all of a sudden these events were occurring, all of which I had written down as risks, but never really spent any time paying attention to. And it's why I now tell people that I coach, you have to de-risk your business. You have to be proactive. Had I taken the time, I would have thought about the fact that when I was in Panama City in January, that since no grounds had been broken, they surely weren't likely to have a park in May. Had I spent any time doing research on the background and references of the company, I might have found out that they weren't reliable. Had I looked at the operating specs of the ride, I might have realized that it wasn't going to function in high ambient temperatures like in Tulsa. But I didn't do that. So what I came to realize is this meme, which is kind of the watchword of how I view myself, recognize Dean Martin, I'm sure. Good judgment comes from experience and experience. Well, that comes from poor judgment. And that was my first example of how you can learn from negative experiences. So we're here today because I know that you can enhance the prospect of building a successful growing enterprise by from inception, focusing on de-risking. And you do that by moving from the left, from the right brain, where your excitement for the deal you're going to do is, is carrying the day. You're enthusiastic, you're moving forward, you're very active, you're very aggressive. I know you can relate to this, Jeremy, in the certain mm -hmm. current situation for sure, but our left brain is turned off. We just don't wanna think about risk. But if we take the time to engage our left brain and be more logical and analytical and objective and really do some thinking, we can undoubtedly find risks. And the ability to identify them leads us to the way in which we might 
de-risk them. I don't know if you know this, but I was involved with aerospace contractors at software that we sold to them. And I learned a, a great deal. One is that every government contractor, before they submit a proposal of any size, has a red team that looks independently at the proposal and figures out where the risk is and what they need to change in order to make the proposal more effective. Most small businesses and entrepreneurs don't do that. So I think it's really, really important, not that it occupy all of your time as an entrepreneur, but that you spend time sitting back and being objective. So I know you indicated, I know a, a lot about you in one sense, but not very much about your business background. I think you told me that you had had situations, you'd started a couple of other businesses that didn't work. Does any of this resonate with you in those situations? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, when I had my limousine company, um, I started and, and everything was great guns and then 08 hit and, uh, you know, it, it started drying up a lot of my business and, uh, you know, I just didn't have plans in place for that. And I expanded too fast and everything like that and didn't have a stable foundation. And then I didn't do much research on the second business and jumped in thinking it was a fantastic idea and uh didn't research a lot of the people that were working with me all this other stuff and yeah just disaster after disaster so in retrospect knowing what you've learned are there things you could have done differently the, the first uh, one is its own yes. situation but in the second one are there things had you taken time to engage your left brain that you might have done differently including maybe not doing it yeah uh one probably not doing it uh but doing it over i would have started smaller and really worked on building it up and i had at the moment had plenty of money and figured money would solve that problem and threw a whole bunch of money and that didn't solve the problem so uh yeah it, it would have started i would have started off smaller and then on facebook and got a, more of a follower and reputation than just starting out of nowhere and then throwing this marketing campaign out. Yeah, so as is the case with me, you are able to go back and reflect and say, if I would have been, but 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 I've been there. That's why I yeah. understand it. I've been there a couple of times after that where I didn't take the time to really de-risk it. But it's an interesting concept if you think about it, that we get so jazzed about our ideas now, one, we don't research them properly, which is one of the things I strongly encourage my clients to do before you take the leap. The problem is we're so focused on doing it that we can't believe that there's the need to do any of those things because it makes such sense. Right. So, yeah. One of the, there was a, something I read on Yahoo Finance, I think it was, no, 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 it was, a, it was, no, it was one of the online mortgage companies where they did research and I think it was like 33% of companies fail in the first three years, 50 in the first five and 67% in the ten, first 10. And one of the major reasons, the major reason is nobody wanted the product and there wasn't enough research done to determine, uh, this is my editorialization, there wasn't enough research done to determine whether there really was a viable market. So, Today, we're going to explore some of those de-risking methodologies. Um, and basically, the agenda is let's talk about who it's for and how they benefit. A little bit about my entrepreneurial journey, just to establish some background. Three ways to de-risk your business is the main focus has always been, but given the fact that I am absolutely confident that we are in a recession, but for those who don't believe it, Certainly, there has to be an acknowledgement that we're in, at the very least, a chaotic economic environment with high inflation. And we're going to talk about de-risking for a recession, much as you encountered in 2008, and whatever challenges are on your mind that you think you'd like to chat a bit about. And of course, there's a gift if we decide to stay through the end, which I know you will because you'd be embarrassed to leave. 
<laughs> get still. So, but but if you get if you have something else that needs to you need to do, just don't hesitate. I got to go wash my hair. <laughs> and we can handle that. All right. <laughs> All right. So, who's the workshop for? It's for aspiring, active, or seasoned entrepreneurs who have dreams that can only be fulfilled with a team of people. You're already beginning that in GPS to Life Success. Who want consistent growth and profitability with minimal risk and who definitely want success as an entrepreneur with less anxiety. You're certainly all of the above. I already know that. I, I find it fascinating. I never really stopped to think about this until recently, but doctors go to school to learn how to be a doctor and attorneys right. go to school to learn how to be attorneys and plumbers and electricians have apprenticeship programs or trade schools Microsoft professionals, but for entrepreneurs, where do you go? Where do you go to understand the level of detail and complexity of being an entrepreneur analogous to medical school, law school, or trade schools? And the answer is, if you have $80,000 a year, you can go to Stanford, one of my favorite schools, um, or Harvard, or a number of other schools that now have very active programs in entrepreneurship. But for those who can't afford $160,000 or who now were they're way more competitive even than when I went to Stanford, um, don't get accepted. The answer is that you have to learn it through doing. Or there is an alternative and that's to work with individuals who have learned from poor judgment. So let's talk about the life of an entrepreneur. There was a song called The Bug, which was written by a fellow named Mark Knopfler. And I'll give you kind of a quick version of what the tune is. I don't hear anything. You can't hear it? No, I don't hear anything. Hmm. All right, I don't know why that is, but it, it goes, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. That's kind of the nature of the tune. Sometimes it all comes together, baby. Sometimes you're a fool in love. Sometimes you're the Louisville slugger, baby. Sometimes you're the ball. Sometimes it all comes together. Sometimes you're going to lose it all. That's the life of an entrepreneur. Right. That's, that's what we're dealing with. And it so perfectly describes Mark Cuban on Shark Tank, who's worth multi-billions now, talks about living in his car. I had my car repossessed from our garage one Thanksgiving decades ago. Got it back, fortunately. But sometimes you're the ball, not the bat. Because good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes, experience comes from poor judgment. That's the value of a workshop like this or, or of getting involved with people who have that kind of experience. Kevin O'Leary is another um, shark on Shark Tank. I don't know. Do you watch Shark Tank? Uh, I've seen a few episodes of it. I don't watch it a lot. They're awesome. I mean, it really points out a lot of things that are really valuable. But Mr. Wonderful, the self-anointed Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary, has this great quote that the hallmark of a true entrepreneur is their ability to keep showing up, as are you. That, that's really the key, whether it's within an entrepreneurial venture or in addition to one that failed or succeeded, the ability to keep showing up is what really defines an entrepreneur. I love this quote. And I believe it vividly. I think it's true in life as well, as evidenced certainly by you, in spite of all the crap you've gone through, and many of the people, not all of the people, in both volumes of Scars to Stars. Life is about keeping showing up as well. But we're not talking about that right now. So quickly, my background, I founded and managed eight companies, co-founded three other companies. I was the principal in a data company that sold for $30 million. 
manage the inception and commercialization of 20 products, actually more. Um, and I've held pretty much every C-level position. And more recently, I've applied all of that knowledge to entrepreneurial coaching. I also, one of the other experiences that I had, we had a software product for aerospace contractors that enabled them to build cost proposals. I also convinced a very classified agency and a number of agencies followed suit that they should use our product for analyzing proposals and their requests for proposal went out stating, you will buy Dan's product or don't bother bidding. Those weren't the words, but that's exactly what it did. So that was one of my proudest moments in terms of really creating a win-win for everybody as a result of continuing to think about and reflecting upon new opportunities. So my successes as a coach, um, I've worked with and I'm still working with Byron on culture issues. Um, Shweta wanted to expand her jewelry brand in India to six major cities, um, talk with her about the risks associated with that, and she is now growing more slowly. Rafu is current client as well. He's working on developing a tutoring business that he's had and wants to capitalize on. I spoke with Michaela about next steps. She moved from Denver to North Carolina and had two babies, and we talked about how she could begin to reintroduce the business she had in Denver after she's ready to stop talking baby talk, but in the meantime, how she could take steps to be ready for that. Um, another client, Jason and Zach, are cybersecurity guys. They hire me just to bounce ideas off of, and Chris hires me to be an accountability coach. He knows what he needs to do. He just needed someone to keep nudging him to get it done. So it's been intriguing, the successes and the relationships I've established as an entrepreneur pro consultant coach um, is just a whole range of different things, which, oh, and then Chris, I do work with his salesperson to do sales training. All of them are different and they're not big consulting jobs, long-term strategic planning. They're just, how can I help you have something that you don't currently have to aid you in your business approach? But let's step back for a second and let's talk about your success, specifically now with GPS for Life Success. So close your eyes and just think about this. It's Monday morning following a relaxing weekend. You've grabbed a steaming cup of coffee or tea and you smile because you know that your decision to implement these three ways of de-risking have enabled you to, has enabled you to generate ever increasing profits with less stress on you. Put yourself in that place just for a minute and just breathe it in and realize that one Monday morning soon, you'll be having a steaming cup of coffee, confident and smiling because you know that implementing these three ways of de-risking your business has enabled your team and you to generate ever increasing profits with less stress on you, which God knows you deserve. All right, open your eyes and let's talk about three ways of de-risking your company. The first, first, I call your truth. The second, I call U.S. Special Forces. And the third is oil and gas. Clearly, for the most part, pretty cryptic intentionally because I want to delve into each of these individually for a bit. So what is truth? What is your truth? Tell me, what values are important to you? What values and principles and precepts govern your life? Um, well, definitely, you know, I'm, I'm a person that uh, reads the Bible and definitely believes in God. It's my foundation. But my main truth in life is, uh, you know, and, and my saying is that we're in this world together. We need to be lifting each other up is really in we need to just treat each other how we want to be treated and you know i want to be treated with respect and dignity and i want to know that you know people acknowledge when i do work and other people should have the same thing in life 
And so I want them all to know that. So that's basically the main truth that I come to is, is that, um, yeah, that, that, um, that, and I'm a person that character, character means everything to me. There used to be a time where people would just do a handshake on a business deal and it was done and they would do it. And now it's, we're at a time where it just seems like we can't rely on people anymore and it's very difficult. So, uh, you know, I, I really want to build that, that people can rely on me and I want to be able to rely on people. So, excellent. yeah. Excellent. No surprises there for me. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Still recovering from this virus. Um, have you taken the time to write the version of those principles down for GPS for life success? I have not. Well, I would encourage you to think about that. Um, your truth as an individual guides the company's culture. And it's very, very, very important that you write those precepts down this is an example. These are not mine. Some of them re relate to mine, but having fun is one of my core values. Um, respect, respect for the clients, respect for the team members, respect for everyone, um, honor, um, implying integrity and the same kinds of issues that you're talking about. Um, empowerment is another of mine. I think that, I don't think, I absolutely know that writing them down, telling people about them, hiring based on them, all of those things are the foundation of your company, just like they're the foundation of you, Jeremy. So you need to write them down, publish them, propagate them, talk about them, reward people with them, and in other ways manage to them, and that will define the culture that you that you have. The, the, I'll give you an example. I worked for a company. After my amusement ride experience, I went to work for one of the subsidiaries, which was a computer time-sharing company. Uh, we were selling, at the time, the only, there was no competition, software product that enabled structuring of certain kinds of municipal bond issues. We had every single every single investment banker in New York City, and at that time they were many, not anymore, was a client of ours. And we were generating $80,000 a month in business, grown that from a dead stop. I came to work for the company that had a, a piece of business with AT&T that was about a million and a half a year. And we were doing a million from a dead stop, um, 80 grand a year with one person in an office in New York providing support. And he supported his clients. Time sharing was a situation where you put your phone in a coupler and then you'd use a terminal, it wasn't even a computer, just a typewriter to communicate with the computer that did the processing somewhere else remotely. It's like cloud, very early version of cloud. But Russ had to use his phone to put into the coupler in his apartment when he was working at two o'clock on Sunday night and didn't have a phone to talk to his clients, asked Phil, who was a new manager of the office, if he could have a phone beyond that the company would pay for. To do that, it was $8 to install it and $5 a month. And the office manager managing an office doing not only 80,000 a month from that, but the other businesses beyond that, asked Phil came to me to see, excuse me, if he could do that, I of course affirmed it and we got the phone. At the end of the month, my boss, who was the president, I was the marketing VP, called me in indicating that he'd seen that I'd approved a phone for Russ's office. I'm sorry, for Russ's home. Yep, I did, Jerry. Well, I've had other people ask me to do that and I've always said no because I think it's a bad precedent. I said, well, Actually, I think it's a perfectly good precedent for anyone who's trying to support $80,000 in business with 
working on weekends from his apartment and in the middle of the night, I think it's a pretty good precedent. And I would do that anytime the opportunity presented itself. Jerry said, well, we obviously have a problem. I said, yep, what, 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 what would you propose I do in this situation in the future? And he said, well, I would propose that you use your best judgment. Well, my comment was, as yours would be, clearly that isn't working or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Right. So give me some guidelines. And his comment was, um, his comment was, you just need to understand, Dan, you can make any decision you want, but I can overrule any decision you make at any time if I want to. Well, that was it. I knew our values were quite uh, different and I couldn't accept that. And I knew then I was leaving and I spent two weeks putting together thoughts on how to go about that and then turned in my resignation with two weeks notice. I then spent, this was just after I'd already committed to the amusement park ride that never mm -hmm. operated that year with obligations in September. I spent the rest of the year, I don't even remember how I lived. I didn't pay any of the obligations, renegotiated with everyone and they were fine. Um, putting together plans for what the business was I wanted to start. I knew I wanted to start a business. And I began writing down my thoughts about, based on what I had learned about how I thought people in the company should deal with one another, how people within the company should deal with clients and the outside world and so on. There was not such a thing that was a big deal at that time called company culture. I began reading about it years later, but that's what I had defined. And I use that document for everybody that I hired to let them know what the core values are of the company. Now, when I hire, I use questions derived from those core values, which I would also encourage you to think about, open-ended kinds of questions that don't make it clear what your values are, but allow you to solicit information from prospective employees or team members about what those what those values are and whether they hold them. I would never hire someone who didn't comply with the culture, regardless of how skilled they are. That's how vividly I believe in that. So culture is the number one way to de-risk your company. I had a company that ended up reducing in force from 28 to five when I had a huge layoff. Um, people stayed with me because they bought the vision and they had the passion for years without ever knowing they were gonna get paid. Never had anything like that. Never could have imagined. And many of them never got paid, including me. Of course, they always got, always got money before I did, but it was a phenomenal experience and a real indicator of what people are willing to do if they accept the culture and if you hire them based on that. Every company has a culture. It's just not gonna be the one you want if you allow it to go on by itself because ultimately people will determine the culture by emotions and irritations, didn't get an increase, upset with someone because of how they were treated and they start propagating unrest and a culture becomes other than what you want. So right. if you do nothing else, I would strongly in the midst of everything else that you're doing to get GPS to life success going, strongly encourage you to not only create core values, propagate and manage through them, but also as you grow, create questions from each of the values, maybe five, and then use them at random when you're interviewing people to begin to understand how they feel about issues that are your core values. Here's a couple of interesting examples of people that didn't do that. I saw these on Yahoo Finance after COVID had begun to abate. This Carter Lewis, a restaurant entrepreneur, says, I don't think it's a matter of people wanting to stay home and stay on unemployment. I think that people just don't want to go back to the same. Well, if Mr. Car Mr. Lewis, if you would have had a culture in place, the people might never have left. And had they left, would certainly be willing to come back. But if all you're doing is writing a paycheck and all they're getting is a paycheck, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. This other, other gentleman, Mike Draper, same kind of a thing. I realized that people were interested in not just pay, but on how they're being treated and what type of work environment. I mean, these are examples of the typical way of looking at a company without any regard for why people are there 
or what you want to have them be like in order to be there. So any questions about that? Any thoughts? No, it's fantastic. Absolutely. And it's just, you know, it's kind of like I do when I talk with people, I, I feel people out and then see if they do align with me but i haven't laid down the values like we were just talking about so that i have that right there to look at and really match everything up and i like that and i think that that's something that'll definitely i'm gonna write something up and send it to all of the coaches and all the people working on the team and make sure i implement that as well that you know they understand that and everybody's on the same page um you know i when you assume you know what they say about assuming I do. Uh, yeah, you know, so it's good when you lay that out and then people know what to expect and you know what to expect from them. They know what to expect from you. And um, yeah, I think that would open things up a lot more. So uh, absolutely. I see the value in that. Good. And you, you exude all of what your values are, Jeremy. So you at the point that you're in now, you, you've accomplished a lot of that with the coaches and with the, the individuals. I only know of one who work with you, the problem becomes more difficult as you grow, which I believe you will, and I'll do everything I can to help that, because you get farther away from the individuals that are doing other things in the company. Yeah. They may not as easily perceive that, and it needs to be it needs to be done so the levels of people, or I don't even like to call them levels, but the, the people who um, come between you and others in a management kind of a situation are as confident and comfortable with it. And, and, and I really mean um, when I, when I do my, my actual course with people, we go through and define the values and define questions from each of them and, and, and really refine them with others in the course, excuse me, so that they're really able to pick from, you know, what it would be like 30 questions, you know, pick 10, and, and because of who you are, you will make clear what your values are right off the bat in some sense, but you don't want to, you don't want to make them clear. You don't want to make those values clear to people you're hiring or maybe even coaches you're getting involved with without asking them questions that will lead you to understand their values before you tell them what yours are. After you hire them, that's when I would, hand out the set of core values and say, do you have any questions about these? I believe <coughs> we're compliant or otherwise you wouldn't be here. Anyway, <clears throat> let's go, let's go to de-risking number two. And it has to do with U.S. Special Forces. Um, I believe, and I think most Americans believe, that our Special Forces are the best warriors in the history of civilization or maybe even before civilization. They're taught to be independent, yet work as a team. They're trained in various areas of med medicine and war fighting. They have incredible weapons. They have drones and they have satellites, but they're selected very carefully so that we're sure that they comply with the core values of our special forces. But as well as they do as individuals, and they do supremely well, they don't do it on their own. They do it because they're a part of a team where there's basic research, applied research, development, production, like I said, drones, um, artillery, um, satellites, AWACS, planes, weapons, uniforms, camouflage, all of those things cost hundreds of billions of dollars. And that's what has gone into making these warriors what they are. They're a part of a massive team. And the end result is those people become the warriors that they are because of who they are, how they're selected, and what their team has done for them. It's exactly the same in a company. People within a company need to work as a team. And they are able to do that for a number of reasons. This is how I view it. Um, and I think this is a way to de-risk a company as well. Higher to your core values, 
empower people within the areas of expertise and domain. My mentor, Max, was incredible in so many ways. But one of the things that he talked to me about, which I really love, is how he believes that the corporate typical hierarchy is really, really needs to be turned upside down, where the folks touching the customers and the clients are the ones at the top. Those below are people who have a better name on a business card, a better network, more judgment, more experience based on poor judgment, something. And where the people at the top of this new inverted hierarchy know what they're entitled to make decisions about, and they know that they're going to be supported in their decisions. But if there's something they need that they don't have or know, they know who to go to, and they're not uncomfortable doing it. They know that decisions they make will be supported, but also to the extent they don't turn out, as is the case with entrepreneurs and managers, that they will be talked with, that they'll, they'll have a conversation with the manager about what they did, how they did it, and if it's appropriate, maybe with the rest of the team to talk about what might have been a more effective way to go about that not by way of judgment or punishment, but rather by way of understanding how we can learn from that experience. So I have hired people and I've hired them outside of a culture way, way, way long ago. And I ended up regretting it. Now, when I hire people, they all have a concept of the core values. They know they're empowered. They know that I respect them. I expect them to respect others in the team and they, are empowered to do what they need to do. It's an incredibly effective way to run a company. And certainly with your background and your skill set, this is a no brainer for you. I think you exude all of this anyway, but I think it's important to never forget about the fact that the team is not only, is not only there to be empowered, but they're also there to be available to solicit information from. They're the ones who know what's going on on the front lines. So when things get rough, you have questions and you're back up against it. I actually wrote a post on this on Monday and talked about it in my live stream yesterday. I'm writing a follow-on post about it today. And my live stream tomorrow will be about what do you do? What are the things you need to stop and think about when all of a sudden things don't work out the way you plan? And now you're in the middle of a situation that you need to figure out. And one of the things I recommend is talk to the people. I always believe in transparency. I know you do too, um, but talk to them, not with the fear that you feel in your head and your heart, but with the issues that are on your mind about what's going on and what we might as a team do better. Not only will you get answers from them that could be beneficial, but they feel a part of the solution. Another way of creating bonding to ensure the quality and the and the nature of the team so that's the second issue any follow-on thoughts or comments about that uh no no i gears are turning in my head as you're talking <laughs> about some things and uh you know with the team and more of it's about um incentives and what i can do to incentivize and uh let everybody know that they're part of a team and give them some goals to work together towards um you know so i've got some ideas that are running through my head on that uh the other day i was just doing a meeting with johanna one of our coaches and she is actually, she travels all over the world and she was just at Bali. Bali, is that how you say it? I think, no, okay, I, so yeah. yeah, Bali. And she actually sets up uh, trips and uh, retreats and things like that. So she met up with some people and has it set up so that she can do a retreat out in Bali. And they get a boat that's for like a week. They got a mansion. They've got this huge boat. They've got, she's got everything planned out. And it's like $1,600 per person for this week long luxury trip out in Bali. And I'm going, I talked to her and I said, boy, that would be a heck of an incentive when we hit 5,000 active subscribers on our app 
where we do a base for our coaches where we say, okay, we'll pay for this trip in Bali for, for everybody. Um, and then, so like I said, so, you know, it kind of got my gears turning, and especially when you were just talking, it kind of revisited in my head and I'm thinking different tiers and levels and achievements and stuff like that. So, um, so it, it, it kind of went with what you said, but a little different, but you know what I mean? Oh, not different at all. I think it's very much in line with how you manage the, to those core values. It, you know, you reward people, you acknowledge people based on those values. You set set goals. I think it's very much in line. You have you actually have two, uh, two, two groups, of course, that are on the team, the people within your company and the coaches. So I mm -hmm. think you're very wise to recognize excuse me, that the coaches are a part of a different it, kind of a superset of the team and, and the people in GPS to Life Success who are actually a team working with you to enable all of this is, is another set of people who need to be considered. I think, I think those thoughts are very relevant and very, very on track. Yeah, because I want everybody... <clears throat> No, so I'm choking up when I talk. Um, you know, I just want everybody to know and then give them, like I said, give them some goals to go towards and some steps. And, um, you know, like I said, include everybody because that's the whole thing with this program is it's not just my app. Yeah, I'm providing the platform, but it's all of us working together. That's how it, it works. All of us have to do it. You know, if we have coaches over here that aren't doing a certain thing, then we fall off in that area and then we could lose clients. So we've got to keep everybody you know, working together as a team, understand that this is all, it belongs to all of us. And as it grows, they grow and, and everything. So. Yep. Yep. Absolutely agree. All right. Well, de-risk methodology number three, I call oil and gas. Oil and and gas. I want you to imagine that you're heading across the Mojave desert to come to see me in Denver and you come to that place where it says 135 miles before you can get gas. And you realize that you're, I don't know, do you, do you, I, don't, I don't think you have a family, right? No. All right, well, let's assume that you're by yourself and you realize that your tank is a little less than half full. You think you can make it 135 miles with no problem. It's getting late in the evening. You don't wanna go back 10 miles to the gas station. So you decide to go ahead. Something happens in the middle of the desert and your gas is gone. And now you have a problem where you're stranded. It's the middle of the night. Your cell phone doesn't work. Very little traffic. So you're in a situation where you wish that you would have gone back that 10 miles to get gas so that you would have not taken the risk of heading across the desert and found yourself in the middle of the desert without the means of going forward. Well. It's very much like capitalization. Capitalization is critical to a company's success, obviously, you well realize that. Having enough capital at the beginning to anticipate what could happen is equally critical. Now, oftentimes that isn't the way it is. Oftentimes people don't allow it to be the way it is because they're anxious to get going and they don't take the time to really think about what kind of capital they need. Now, I'm not talking about only outside capital. There are lots of ways of generating capital. It doesn't have to come from investors. Um, it come from a range of different sources, but, and, and much of it could be from your own work and sweat, which is what I've done. In some instances, you've done certainly as well. But the right way to do it, taking all of that into account, is to create a cash flow plan where you think about where you're going, how are you gonna get there? How much is it gonna cost? When will you reach consistent positive cash flow for at least three months in a row? And how are you gonna fund it? And there are all kinds of ways, we talk about that at another time, to fund whatever's going on. But after you've done all of that, then you need to think about Hofstetter's Law. There's a book called Gödel Escher Bach, an eternal golden golden braid, where the author, Douglas Hofstadter says, it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account 
Hofstetter's law, which mm -hmm. is that it always takes longer than you expect. So I always ask people to give it the two times rule. Once you've come up with that cash forecast, monthly cash forecast, double the time and double the amount. And you'll still be lucky if you achieve it. I have a very good friend, really our best friend, who sold a company for tens of millions of dollars years ago. And he and I talked about this and he said, actually, I actually did it two and a half times. Every project I had, I found that it was more like two and a half times what I objectively thought it was. So when you mm -hmm. get into the middle of the company and you're without capital, just as the case when you run out of gas in the middle of the Mojave, you're at risk, you will definitely pay up for the gas and you'll waste a ton of time because you're in the middle of the problem and you, whether you're successful or not. One of the things that I learned, Stanford is an incredible business school. One of the best blessings I've had was to be able to go there. One of the two things that I learned that I've never forgotten beyond how to think, that's really what they teach. They, it, Stanford is a big case study school. So they're just case after case after case where you talk about stuff, uh, associate various aspects of a company situation. But there are two specific things I learned. One is how to calculate net present value. And the other is that growing companies consume cash. They don't throw cash off. So oftentimes people go into companies. I don't really talk this much since I started getting over this virus. Um, they go into companies expecting that they're going to throw off cash as they grow. It's not true. Investment in resources, in people, in computers, all kinds of things precede revenue, as I'm sure you realize. So you have to plan for that and plan for it wisely. I mean, I was in a situation where I actually had to pledge half of my company to get a $30,000 loan. The company was worth well more than that. And I was grateful to have it because I desperately needed the money. Um, it, it brings back the quote from, from Kevin O'Leary again about the hallmark of a true entrepreneur is their ability to keep showing up because you've got to find a way. You've got to find a way when you're in the middle of the, the, the success or at a problem point, you've got to find a way to go forward Oftentimes it's monetary. And if people would just take the time, as silly as it seems to many, to put together a monthly cash flow statement and then apply the two times rule, be a whole lot better off than if they don't. Have you have you taken the time to do that? Um, yeah, you know, I've I've sat down in uh <laughs> It's been interesting because, you know, we were talking originally about, um, you know, planning for things and what could go wrong and other things like that. And as you've seen, I have, well, uh, we were originally supposed to launch in, what was the, originally in August, and here we are in mid-October still developing things, but we're we're doing well with everything. But there were more things that I was going to have on the app that you know i needed to pay for in order for us to have and you know i had it set up the reason i did the tier and i had those separate pieces that were add on was what if the money is not there i can't afford to have my company fold because we don't have the right finances for those and sure enough the finances haven't been there yet uh because we've run into some different things and i've had to restructure stuff but those pieces are stuff that's not they're not mandatory for us to get this going for people. And when we have them, they're going to be great additions to it. But uh, yeah, and, and so it's been interesting with the whole financing thing, but with the layout, but it's been really, I've been very blessed, like I said, because of my past experience to really set this up to go, okay, what do we need minimally to go and uh, at least make sure that I can hit the minimum goal with that to get this going. Uh, and I do have some other areas that I'm trying to get some financing with for it and stuff like that. We'll see how it goes, but you know, we just, like you said, keep showing up, keep putting one foot in front of the other, but 
Um, you know, I think we've we've got all the right tools and the solid foundation. And then the other thing that I realized from my other businesses is keep my overhead as low as possible. Yep. And that's what I've done with this as well. I mean, the app is paid for, all the other things are paid for. Um, you know, so my my expenses is staff that's helping out and some of the software that I use, but we have minimal expenses, which is great. So yeah, I, I commend you for that. And and for the forethought that goes into what happens if, because the if happens all too often and failure to recognize that and account for it could, had you not spent the time thinking about it and been cautious about your overhead, it could have been a lot different. It'd be nice if some of your coaches actually paid you like me. Um, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, um, you know, it's great because, um, you know, we've had some coaches pay, but, and I haven't pushed to get more coaches on the platform itself because I wanted to make sure we had the foundation and the protocols in order. And this has been an experiment with the different coaches. Where are people getting confused? I would rather deal with that with 16 coaches than deal with that with 60 coaches. Yep. No, I think that's wise as well. And there's something else. Are you familiar with the concept, or you, you are, whether you recognize the term, of a minimal viable product? Uh, I can guess about what that's at. <laughs> yeah, you've yeah. actually described it. I mean, I yeah. never heard that until the last couple of years, but now it's a big deal in the software world. What is the minimal minimal viable product get that on the street and let it start helping you with the revenue production and add-ons are fine but you we the metagami software product that i've been involved with for literally 35 years is finally commercially viable finally after many fits and starts we ended up parting ways with the visionary many years ago probably gosh 20 now, um, well, no, 10, because he was bound and determined that until we achieved the perfect product, we weren't going to release anything. And the other principal and I told him, we're not going to get there. We have no more sources of money. We've got to start applying what we've got to, to clients. And between Ulrich and I, we generated, I generated a million and a quarter probably close to a million and a half dollars and Ulrich, a couple hundred thousand dollars with a product that wasn't perfect, that demanded more work from the developers on solving the application issues as Buzz had told us, but he was not willing to do anything. And we continued to enable the product to advance and the company ultimately failed. And then we started all over again, but he was bound and determined we weren't going to do anything with the market until we had the perfect product. Well, you might never get to the perfect product. So you're very wise to think about it and figure out what you basically need to get it out there, get some revenue production, and then, you know, you'll be able to use that revenue to fund the next steps you have in mind. When you have yeah. something great, I know this with our software and with other software I've used that helps people solve problems they've never been able to solve before. Once they solve those problems, all of a sudden it opens up all kinds of other ideas about other things they can do that they had never thought about because they couldn't solve the first set of problems. Once those problems get solved, other things will arise. And as creative as you are, that's what's gonna happen. So just add those new things to the things that are on the list that aren't in the, in the minimal viable product and get something out there. I agree 100% that's the way to go. All right. Yeah. And that's in and, and I honestly that's the that's the hardest part, like you were talking about. And anybody over there, especially it's their first business. Of course, it's your baby. You're putting all your time and effort into it and you want it to be perfect, like you said. And then next thing you know, you're you're waiting until it's absolutely perfect and all this other stuff. And then like you you just keep waiting and it, it never really gets to that point and it ends up a lot of times it can discourage like I've been discouraged numerous times because of that and even with this app like we were supposed to be at a certain level we were supposed to have these certain things ready to go by this certain point and when those come I have to not take those and 
let it defeat me. I have to sit there and go, okay, it is what it is. We move on and, and we're good to go. And it's okay that it's not perfect. It's okay. And I think that's, that's one of the hardest things for people. It is for sure. One of the other things that I talk about, I sort of allude to, but I talk about in the posts I'm going to do today, should have done it early, but I had other things that occupied me, um, is something I'll offer you. And that's, I, I remember I had two friends when I was in my first entrepreneurial venture who were also entrepreneurs. And I would call or they would call when things, well, we talked anyway, but when there were issues, we would call one another. And I went to, remember one time I was hung up on something and kind of not sure how to proceed. And I called and I said, have you ever been in a situation like this? And he said, oh, does it feel like this? Like you're in a size 32 wetsuit, but you wear <laughs> a size 38? And I said, yeah, it feels very much like that. And he made me laugh. And then that calmed me down. And that's the most important thing. You have to change that emotion from fear and terror into calm in order to once again, now engage your right brain yeah. to be creative. But I would encourage you, if ever you're in that situation, if you want someone to talk to who understands and may be able to help you talk through stuff, always here for you. Oh, I thought you were going to recommend me to the other guy that started the no, project and you guys part of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, but somebody yeah. that, that you can feel comfortable talking to just to allow your mind to start flowing ideas and get it away from that fear, I think is real important. So if ever you need someone to talk to, you know I'm here. Absolutely. Appreciate that. All right. Let's go briefly through something that you experienced that I've added recently in light of the impending and current um, economic environment, call it what you will, you know, where revenue was doing this or this, and all of a sudden you decided to do that as you encountered in 2008, or maybe that. And expenses were doing were steady and all of a sudden started jumping up and profit going down. In the case of your limo company, obviously that ended up in a failure of that particular business and learning experiences that will make what I'm telling you, you'll relate to almost all of these things as you're now in that mode where the world is not working the way you want. What do you do? How do you get things back on track. Well, once again, now's the time to engage the right brain and start being creative, you know, meditate. I used to meditate when I was in my first venture. I should keep doing it, but it's kind of fallen away. But it was the most incredible experience where I would just close my eyes and think of a, a nonsense word. I went through the whole transcendental meditation Thing with the flower and all of that they gave me a word that i've never spoken to anyone else but it doesn't need to be that it can be like many people just say mm, but just relax your mind it's amazing like in the time when i used to jog i would wake up in the morning scared to death i'd go out and run two miles nothing had changed but it was organized in my mind somehow and i was able to think about it as opposed to being terrified so how to de-risk revenue and expenses. Well, create ways to advance revenue in time by getting your MVP out there, your minimal viable product, offer discounts for buying now, create strategic relationships with organizations that might end up taking some piece of revenue in the future, but can help you move forward, um, conserve cash wherever possible. None of these things will be a surprise. Purchase only when you have closed business, Match your purchases to the actual cash inflow. Buy less expensive items. Don't upgrade hardware unless mandatory. Buy subscription monthly, not annually. Even though it may be, cost more, it conserves cash. Buy in smaller quantities. As to growth, delay hiring until revenue justifies. Match a salary to the cash inflow from the, the sources you're confident of. Use offshore, short, excuse me, offshore resources. I use them extensively, and they're very valuable. I have a full-time employee in India who's incredible. 
less than a thousand dollars a month, I would pay ninety thousand a year to get someone like that in America. Ten ninety nines instead of employment. Um, limit the monetary perks in favor of a culture that people can relate to. I told you what my situation was. People believe in what you're doing and your vision and dream is really palpable, very easy to get behind. So think about that. I don't think you need to worry about that, but pivoting strategically um, to deal with cash rich companies, for example, or products and services you can offer them rethink your sales and marketing focus tactically what are there are there any new products and services to help existing clients address recession and stagflation cost control employer retention all of these things are ways to think about how you deal with things in a recession stagflation or uncertain economic environment so that's that's kind of the key before I go on to the last part. I don't expect this is going to be relevant to you right now, but I want to just get an answer from you about it when I just as a test. So any any other challenges or issues that you think you'd like to chat about now that we haven't discussed that I can help with? Um, you know, we um as far as because we're recording so that we have this for other people and i'll talk to you more about things after recording okay. don't too much but yeah you know the big thing is of course you know i want to make sure that the people that are doing stuff for me right now um like lee and jennifer do get some financing and that's um we're at the point now where i can start getting some more coaches i believe um it's just uh, the biggest challenges have been getting everybody on the same page all these different coaches to get stuff submitted different things like that that they need to do on a timely manner. Um, you know, that's been one of the headaches with it, but um, no. And then I think the big thing is, is, of course, bringing traffic in. That's that's a big challenge that we need to, you know, take care of. We do have some plans for that to get things rolling, but we need to come up with a more viable plan that uh you know will will steadily bring people in and i'm working on that i'm working with some groups and, and in classes and stuff but that's taking a little bit more time but you know those are some of the main things that i'm looking at right now what do you think about this um you know the concept of a summit i know you know what that means yeah um, the, the nice thing about summits is that you can share the mailing lists of the people in the summit to the extent that people register. What, what would you think about a summit or maybe a couple of summits with all or a couple of subgroups of coaches that could all send out their mailing, their emailing, send out to their list and publicize on social media uh, the summit that would attract people who would then give you the possibility of subscribers, certainly people that you could then start emailing to as you add more features or do things you want to make them aware of. I know that's a, a, a time-consuming thing to put together, but that might be a way to gather um, information, insights, and prospects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is actually something I have looked towards now. Uh, one of the things that, you know, when I talked before and I had people do the 15-minute interview, with me was it so that I could take in or so I could make webinars, small webinars and send those out in special areas and stuff. When we get to that point, we could send those out to a try and track people. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing and releasing, and I sent the ebook to everybody to review is that all the coaches are part of this collaboration ebook that we created uh, ultimate life hacks, GPS, life success, ultimate life hacks. Um, so each one of the coaches, we're going to make a copy um and have them send the copy out to all of their tribe and mailing list saying hey i'm in this uh book and come to gps to life success download the app sign in and get the book for free uh you know so that'll be a way to kind of jump start it a little bit here and uh yeah and then definitely with the summits the cool thing is is that we can actually host a summit on our app we have that ability so we can do summits and host it on the app as well and everything so 
Um, it's in the works. And the funny thing is, is uh, I don't know if you know what my job, one of my jobs is that I actually help run summits. So uh, yeah, I do that all the time. And I'm actually helping somebody later today put together their first summit. Oh, cool. So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's something I'm very familiar with and definitely feel that that would go. Now, uh, to be honest, most of the summits that I've done have been three-day summits and it's more high dollar things than it is for the small ones. But I think definitely having workshops for people that we do a workshop and collaboration of coaches and doing some summit workshops and stuff like that to help people uh, is, is a wonderful idea. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what I'm thinking about is ways to leverage the social media platforms and email lists of the coaches. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, again, like we were talking about, that's going to be one of the big things from us. Like um, Sean Lowry, for instance, he is the veteran guy. He's on our app. I uh, got him on. He's got 330,000 followers on TikTok. Yeah, his average post, He put a fa- he, if he puts something on Facebook, his average likes are around 1,200 to 1,500 likes. Oh. Um on anything within hours. So he's got a following. And so, uh, yeah, that's definitely been my goal since day one was really to start, you know, having all the coaches reach out to their tribes. And that's why I was like, this is a whole team effort. The growth, everything that we do comes from all of us doing that. So setting up some more incentives, things that they want to put out to their tribe, like right at the moment, all I've got is the ebook, which is a nice start, but I am definitely yeah. open to sitting down and kind of hashing out some more ideas and and doing what we can to get more people involved. Cool. Coaches involved. Cool. Yeah, I like I like that. I think it's I mean it's an exciting project to be involved with. To really and you make it exciting. I mean you're you're the glue, of course, and and it's working. So let me go into this because I, I'm I'll, I, let me just see, do it as I normally would. Yeah. So Defy is a course that I've created as a follow on to what we've talked about here. Um, it's about define the odds against business success. The D has reference to defining your culture. E stands for exploring appropriate hiring practices. F is finalizing your core values. And I is to integrate your core values into interviews. So what we do in DeFi, I'll talk about in a minute, but the catharsis that I had a few years ago that really prompted me after my daughter, we our daughter had a baby with in vitro three and a half years ago. She, and we live in Denver, we moved in with her two days before Piper was born. And then we stayed there for two years because we couldn't, imagine not living with them um, even though we probably yeah we still were valuable to her because she travels a lot and she's a single mother um she hadn't found a boyfriend until piper was born and now she has a guy that's just incredible so anyway we, we paid rent on an apartment and lived there one uh, lived there one night in two years but while i was with karen she would overhear me talking with people who are entrepreneurs, just sharing thoughts. And she said, you know, dad, you really need to think about a way to monetize this. There's so much that I hear you talk about that people just don't stop to realize. So she's the one that started me thinking about it a few years ago. But then I reflected back um, many years ago, I think it would have been probably 10, the Stanford Graduate School class that I graduated with has the same class secretary still 50 some years later as it had from day one. And he sent out an email to people in the class soliciting information about what's going on with the note that he has enough on grandkids. So he would appreciate anything other than that. Excuse me, Jeremy, Mm -hmm. one second. Sure, will you do me a favor, sweetheart, and get me some more water, doll? Please, I have my thermos here. And I called him because I'd been working on, I said for 35 years, this Metagami project. And I told him about it. He said, oh my God, Jess, please send that to me. So what are you gonna get? A line, maybe two, an inch 
column inch on an alumni magazine. Sent him, uh, in order to send him that, I sat down and started writing and I stopped at 12 pages. And I called him and I said, I don't know what's gotten into me, but what should, what of this do you want me to send you? And he said, just send it all to me and I'll take out what I want. So I edited it down to eight pages and I sent it to him. And literally in 45 minutes, here's what I got back. I'm several pages into the eight pages and truly believe that the whole eight pages should be printed in the Stanford Graduate Business School Alumni Magazine as a separate article. He went on to say, in all caps, this is all his, this should be required reading for all first-year MBAs everywhere and anyone who wants to start a business. He then sent that to the editor of the alumni magazine, and here's what he said. I yesterday received the most recent magazine. It emphasizes that the, the alumni magazine content should be about stories that teach. In 40 years as a class secretary, I have had two such submissions from classmates who do that. The current one from Dan Walkowitz. Nice. I guess I'm again enunciating my feeling that I learned from others who have fought in the trenches of business and learned little from PhDs who have never been there. Incidentally, we had none of that type of teacher at Stanford. They were all mm. incredible. <laughs> Dan's catharsis is excellent in that he inserts reflections where he questions his own actions in retrospect. So even then, when I wrote this catharsis is what I call it, after each area where I talked about something that had happened, I have an inserted paragraph called reflections that I would say, here's why I did what I did. Here's what I could have done. Here's what might have happened. Here's what did happen. Would I have been better? That kind of thing. And that's what he was talking about. So I realized after Karen uh, had a conversation with me that even Bruce, who created a large accounting firm in Seattle, appreciated what I had to say. And that's when I be, first began to realize that I did have something that, that might be worthy of um, people's interest. So Defy is the course actually one of two courses, but the one that follows from this, where people who decide to take the course will participate in online Zoom meetings, four learning modules, and two modules for detailed work and questions in weeks three and six. It'll take place over a six week period, 60 to 90 minutes for each session on Wednesday or whatever, evenings mm -hmm. of successive weeks. And there's a money back guarantee upon completion of the first module for anyone who doesn't feel that it's valuable. But the whole point of it is this was a, something that a guy I work with who had previously been at McKinsey, who came to my company, one of the companies I had founded, said that his boss asked him after he completed a real exciting week of offsite training, what were you going to do when you get to the office on Monday? Because what happens, we all have experienced it. You go offsite, you do something for a few days, you've made a jillion notes, you come back to work with all these great plans, and then Monday morning happens, and you never go back to the notes because the work that you have to do consumes you. So one of the courses that I did, the course I did earliest, um, ended up with a, basically, I didn't achieve this. So I've now restyled the course so that at the time the course is done, the six weeks are done, core values will be established by every participant in the course. They will have been discussed and refined with those others in the course. Five or so questions will have been established for each core value, and they will be once again refined by interaction with people in the course, and then we will talk about how you would grade or score the responses you get to the various questions in terms of how compliant they are with your culture and your core values. So the entire 
six weeks is dedicated to those ends. So for people who decide to take option one, the price would normally be, you know, this drill, Jeremy, uh, mm. $34.97. But for people who sign up this week, the price is $14.97, $2,000 savings with a money back guarantee through the completion of module one. We also have a second option, which is the DeFi course, three biweekly mastermind sessions, which are priced at 450. The normal price would be 3947, but for people who choose this option, it would be 2,797 over, two, uh, over a $1,000 savings. And once again, the same guarantee. For option three, the DeFi course, not three, but seven, a full quarter worth of biweekly mastermind sessions, priced at $1,050. Three implementation sessions where I would work with the individual talking about now we've, we've begun to implement these things. I'm having issues. How can I do this? What is more effective? Three sessions with me that would cost $1,191 commercially excuse me, a total $5,738 would be priced at $2,997. So same guarantee. So the options are the course for $1,497, the course with three biweekly masterminds for $2,797, the course seven biweekly mastermind sessions, and three hands-on implementation sessions as you begin to apply the culture and the core values for a price of $29.97. So I know you're not gonna buy this, although I'd love to have you participate at some time, but if you were able to think this would be a priority, which of the three options would you pick? Oh yeah, definitely. I, I see the value in all of them and in option three, uh, is a no-brainer for somebody who's getting started with a company, um, especially at that. I mean, you have the twenty-seven ninety-seven for option two, and it's only two hundred dollars more for the option three. So, really, it kind of what's the point of option two? We'll just go with option three. Uh, so, so yeah, option so, three would definitely work. Okay, so this is this is I have never had anyone pick other than option three. And this is a technique I learned from some online email that I got. If you ever, if you offer three options, you didn't even mention option one because people typically dismiss it because there's so much more that's relevant in each of options two and three. And yeah. just as you said, you dismiss option two because there's so much more in option three for 200 bucks that why would you even think of anything your, your thought process is exactly what this approach is designed to elicit. So this is something you might think about too. Um, I know Kim doesn't do this, um, Kim Walsh Phillips, um, and others don't do it, but I've begun doing it because it works every time. And, it's, and to me, that's what people ought to do. That's what I would do. That's what provides the best value. So... Anyway, I, I, I wanted to introduce it to you. One, to confirm that still I'm unanimous in that option. Um, and then the gift is basically what I'd give to you anyway. You can, this is basically three, a free 30 minute session about anything you wanna talk about. Plus being aware of the clubhouse room, I do with a couple of other serial entrepreneurs every Tuesday, um, 10 o'clock mountain time. But for you, Really, anytime I can help, I'd love to do that. So I'm Perfect. going to stop the recording.